So uh, COVID has actually been really interesting. Like out of just like out of Irene and Sandy, where just everything went to hell, and that was the beginning of something new. COVID's been kind of interesting, and unfortunately, it's attached to a lot of suffering, right? But um, we right after COVID hit, uh, we were all throwing away like millions of shellfish, right? Oysters, uh, like um, tractor trailer uh, loads of shellfish because it was all a restaurant product. But of course, you know, the model of diversification was really key. So, you know, it did help. So we had other things we could do, but we couldn't process inside. So what we did was we found um, tobacco barns, a um, hundred tobacco barns locally of a family that's been around since the 1600s growing a specific kind of tobacco that had shut and they, their farm was shutting down and they tried to transition to flowers and things like that. And it turns out kelp is the new tobacco. It looks like tobacco. It dries like tobacco. The workers at the farm, just at the tobacco farm, were like, oh, this is easy. Yeah, we do it the same way. We hoist it up. We set our shutters certain ways. And so I think that's a powerful story of sort of land and sea connection, sharing infrastructure in times of crisis. Um, so that it allows us to stabilize it, store it, and begin selling it. Um, so that, that And that's now a permanent in our model. Right. We're going to farm it, use tobacco barns to dry it and then go from there. So that was one thing. The other thing is what happened to where the kelp's going. My crop last year, uh, part of it went for plant based burgers and flour. Um, uh, then another part went for fertilizer um, and compost to some specialty wineries and regenerative land based farms. And part of it went for bioplastics. So compostable bioplastics made out of seaweed. Um, uh, so that multiple value stream was re was just great. Um, and that's sort of what you begin to create is uh, setting climate resiliency, multiple species, multiple markets. Um, I think the other thing that's happened is the blue carbon and data piece is really moved. I remember, but the vision of the farm is really four quadrant, right? You 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 have income from food, from byproducts like feed and, and bioplastics, things like that. You've got income streams from ecosystem services, so blue carbon, and from data. So the blue carbon piece, we're, we're, we've just uh, beginning to set up a program uh, that's uh, independently certified to take a percentage of our kelp and get it to re certified regenerative land-based farms. So take our carbon that we collect in the kelp and get it into the soil for soil sequestration, so stabilize it there. Um, very traceable um, it's sort of a very rigorous sort of data-driven model, which is really good. Um, and then the data piece, uh, it's interesting because, you know, the question is, can we use our farms as data platforms and actually have farmers collect that data, use sensors, and actually package it and sell it to different folks that, you know, coastal planners, insurance companies, things like that, that want data sets like that. And that becomes yet another income stream for the farm. So I think if the message of the last year, it is resiliency comes from diversification. So diversification of crop, diversification of income, diversification of markets. So we know it collects a, a huge amount of carbon um, to grow. Uh, and the question is where to go. And that's why we like weaving it into, into soil sequestration systems. Uh, to stabilize that. So with like proper soil management, it stays in the soil. So the, one of the big movements in land-based regenerative uh, farming is, is soil health and soil sequestration. So treating the soil um, and protecting it and doing using certain practices in order to um, uh, 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 keep nutrients um, uh, 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 in the ground. And that's like, there's a whole certification process that those land-based farms go through to encourage uh, soil health and to trap that carbon. I, I asked a question at the CNN Climate Town Hall of Elizabeth Warren, and my question was, you know, there's a, my oyster farm was destroyed two years in a row by hurricanes. I hear a lot about the Green New Deal. Green New Deal uh, mentions the ocean one time. Um, you know, how about a Blue New Deal? And what would that look like? So she picked it up and uh, came out first ever on a, um, uh, she developed a Blue New Deal platform as part of her campaign. I think it was the first time the oceans became like a political issue. Actually, Trump, uh, not Trump, uh, Fox News came out and attacked regenerative ocean farming, which is like, you want a metric of success? Like I tell my funders, like there's our metric, right? Um, so, um, uh, and uh, Ayana 
Dr. Ayana Johnson and I, we came out with a, um, a policy brief laying out a bunch of ideas. And then that got sucked into the Blue New Deal. And the things were like, let's train 10,000 young people to plant eelgrass, mangroves, mangroves, kelp, uh, shellfish, like a, you know, a, a civilian conservation core, right? New Deal like, uh, like program creating a climate resiliency fund, setting aside parts of the ocean just for reforestation of kelp forests. So there's a whole um, set of packages there. And I think it was, it was good. And we'll see if it gets picked up again, um, you know, in the, in the coming year. So Green Wave, we've been working intensely in Alaska um, lately, and largely with indigenous communities. And so the, I think there's two strategies, right? In urban centers, we have a, a BIPOC new jobs pipeline into hatcheries where we're taking folks from uh, inner cities. They work in the hatcheries and then get hired uh, from there. And so using that ocean land-based infrastructure as a way to be job creators. Our targeted like ocean farming program are, is really targeted at fishermen directly affected by climate change in indigenous communities. So we're working with the Maori in New Zealand, working with you know folks like Dune Lankard, who's this they're one of the heroes in, of uh, of the Alaskan fights. He he led the fight against the Exxon um, Valdez spill, and um, there we're hoping to plant uh, um, uh, about 10,000 acres with indigenous communities. There we actually in partnership with um, Aleutic Pride and uh, Native Conservancy, we just built the first um, native-owned seaweed hatchery in the country. I think how important that is, right? Like indigenous communities need to own their own seed. Should be like a basic fundamental right. The Maori did something really interesting. The government um, granted uh, 12,000 hectares of water rights to the Maori uh, for ocean farming as part of a reparations program. So this opens up like such an interesting thing where like land, the trouble is we need to un unwind things, right? So like everybody owns land, it's all privatized. So how do we do reparation? The ocean, because of that blank slate, it means we can actually really think through and, and create a strategy of writing, you know, history's wrongs as we're building a climate economy. Uh, but we have farms popping up everywhere, folks that are affiliated with Greenway, but also folks that aren't, uh, you know, because we open source some of, um, oh, so much of our work and, and technology. And the fact that so many people are doing it without us is a great sign. Like this is about movement building at the end of the day, not about franchising and ownership and things like that. And I think that'll be the secret to success. Um, we're, we're going to be rolling out a platform starting uh, two months from now, which is a farmer toolkit where farmers can like enter the depth of the currents, the size of their lease, and it'll spit out a full farm design tied to a budget, a gear list, things like that, like very powerful. Um, a farmer community, a digital, a national digital co-op, and a, um, a, a, a blue carbon uh, auction um uh site right and that's the that's the package and that's we have six thousand people signed up who um for like on a waiting list for green wave programming so that like this is another piece of COVID. it's like taking our programming we're good at training people and really bringing that on online because we'll never be able to you know train six thousand people as a small nonprofit, right so that platform becomes uh, uh really key but i think the momentum's there there are needs for farmers, like like farmers, the low capital costs allow you to get started, like that 20 grand, and start growing. But if you want to take it to the next level, folks do need some money to really do that next scaling, say to use the full, you know, 20 acres, right? And so um, I think there's a needed industry for some sort of, you know, um, you know, two 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 percent interest revolving loan or something. Uh, for the industry, because people, folks are ready to scale. They have the permit permits. They've got the markets. So, yeah. so we, uh, there'll be official launch in the spring, but we're rolling out actually right now the beta version with our first set of existing farmers that we've trained, and then to the next, and then we'll get out to the six thousand people, and then we'll officially uh, launch it. Um, but that's going to allow to have that learning curve, right, where uh, pe people. Because like growing food underwater is extremely difficult. It's the most volatile place to grow food in the world, right? You can't control your soil. Um, uh, there's so many storms and you have um, – uh, uh, and we can't see what we grow. 
So having a network around the country, a knowledge hub of people uh, trying different things, experimenting, learning, and then trading those strategies is just going to be key. Again, key to climate resiliency, right? So like we can begin to see what climate resiliency looks like. You need new business models, place to data, harvest data, harvest blue carbon, things like that. And that's what's going to get us through this next phase, I think, is just like unpacking what a farm is, what an economy is, what a business is. There's a real nexus in New England and New York, um, our two places then, um, in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, there's quite a bit of activity. And then in California, there's a lot of interest and activity, but it's not farming, it's on reforestation. So we actually, GreenWave has the first commercial farm in, in California for seaweed in Humboldt County. And we've teamed up with some folks to do a a um, analysis of the per acre cost of reforestation of kelp forests in California. So there's all this activity, but it doesn't look like farming. It looks like reforestation. And then um, uh, uh, in Europe, um, Scotland, uh, Denmark, um, uh, uh, parts of Ireland, there's a lot of activity there and in France as well. Um, and then in New Zealand and Australia, Australia, there's a huge amount of activity. I think New Zealand's really breaking out. Uh, uh, quite fast because the progressive government's really gotten behind it and thinking about it in terms of like a true, um, uh, uh, you know, carbon drawdown strategy. The, the Wall Street framework of the unicorn has really uh, muddied the climate solutions space. So this idea that like there's just one thing that's going to save us all and all the investors are looking for like, what's that big play? And I'm convinced that we need need to bundle thousands of solutions, invest in them all, let them cross pollinate, let some fail, right? Um, and that's what it's going to look like to fix such a complex problem and and um, uh, and put together a complex like matrix of solutions. But like, I am so sick of folks looking for that bright, shiny, perfect thing. So uh, when I talk to investors now, I'm like, like I, I'm a piece of the puzzle. But like you can't just do you me. You have to do these seven, eight, twelve, like ice on fire. Like you need a whole just stack of solutions and bring them together, bundle them. So and that's why I'm like so proud to be part of Ice on Fire. And so anybody that's pitching like I am going to be the Netflix uh, thing or I'm going to be the climate solutions to say like, we well, you don't have control over ninety eight percent of it. Like that that's just being dishonest. <laughs> so it's you know. Um, it's time to say goodbye to the old world and write a story about the new one, you know? That's that's where we're at.